All right, hello, hello. As soon as we get the slide up, we'll get rolling here. Um, here's, here's the question that we want to start with, though. It's when you're flying over a forest, and if you look out of an airplane window, um, the forest looks the same as it has for uh, hundreds of thousands of years, even though there are hundreds of animal species down there. Um, but when you fly over a modern city, there's one single species that has completely transformed the landscape such that uh, the whole place looks like a motherboard. And so the question is, why? What is going on with our species that makes humans so special? In other words, why don't squirrels design elevators? And uh, why don't alligators uh, invent speedboats to catch their prey? Why don't koalas invent the internet? So the answer has a little bit to do with uh, opposable thumbs and larynx, but it has a lot more to do with what's going on in the human brain. So um, when we zoom in on the brains of different animal species, it's not just the size that matters. It turns out there's a key element here, which is that the distance between sensory input and motor output has vastly increased in humans. And what that means is that between sensing and doing, we have a lot more real estate there to generate possibilities. So that's big change number one. Big change number two is what's called the prefrontal cortex, which is the part just behind our forehead. Humans have so much more of that, and what that allows us to do is simulate possible futures to evaluate what could be. And this human creativity, the human creativity that we see all around us, is mostly thanks to these very subtle changes in the brain anatomy. And these changes are always causing us to lean into the future generating hypotheses and evaluating them. And what's the consequence of this? For starters, it means we don't much like repetition. So in the movie Groundhog Day, a weatherman played by Bill Murray is forced to relive a single day over and over again. Confronted with this seemingly endless loop, he rebels against the monotony. He learns French, becomes a piano virtuoso, champions the downtrodden. Why isn't Bill satisfied just to be a creature of habit? It's because his brain constantly seeks novelty. Doing the same things over and over is uninteresting to the brain. So this is a picture of brain activity when it confronts something that's new. And if you keep showing the same thing to it over and over, it shows less and less activity. And this is a phenomenon known as repetition suppression, which is to say we're not inter the brain is not interested in things that are repeated. So what this means is that novelty is the fountainhead of our creativity. But there's a strange twist to this. We also don't like things that are too novel. We don't want to awaken to discover that gravity is reversed and we're stuck against the ceiling. So there's a trade-off between exploring the unknown and exploiting what we know. And that's why the world is so densely populated with skew morphs. The save button is a floppy disk. The phone icon is an old handset. Email is an envelope letter. We drag files we don't want to a trash can. We buy online in a shopping cart. All of this is a way of keeping an umbilical cord to the past. Too much predictability and we tune out. Too much surprise and we become disoriented. Creativity lives in that tension. So as a result of this, we surround ourselves with things that have never existed before but are practical next steps for us. So what this means is that all new ideas evolve from the old. For instance, innovations that define this generation, like the iPhone, seem to be a bolt out of the blue, but they're not. Here's the IBM Simon from 1993. It was a touchscreen cell phone introduced two decades before. Although it's not obvious or visible, there was a smooth progression of innovation that got us from there to here. All creativity is based on prior experience. All new ideas have a history. Human innovation comes from a continual process of branching. We try out a lot of ideas, some of them survive, and those that live become the basis for the next generation of invention and experimentation. Tony. So if ideas have a history, is it possible to describe how they evolve? We propose a framework that divides the landscape of cognitive operations into three basic strategies, bending, breaking, and blending. These are the primary means by which all ideas evolve. In bending, you take a source and you transform it or twist it out of shape. 
in breaking, you take something like a human body and you break it into pieces. And in blending, you merge two or more sources. So if you take a man and blend it with a bull, in ancient Greece, you get a minotaur. Bending, breaking, and blending are the main operations that underlie innovative thinking. By applying this cognitive software to everything around us, we generate an ongoing tidal wave of novel worlds. Now, creativity can be difficult to see, and a lot of times it's hidden and unaccessible. So for instance, a few years ago, YouTube started offering high-definition videos, but there was a problem. HD video files are huge, and they require high bandwidth to stream properly. Viewers' computers were freezing up. So how did YouTube solve this problem? Here's how. The videos are stored in three resolutions, high definition, standard, and low. So the YouTube engineers broke the files of different resolutions into very short clips. And as a video streams to your computer, software tracks your bandwidth. When there's room to send the high-res clips, that's, what's come through, that's what comes through. When it's limited, the low bandwidth clips go instead. As long as there are enough high-definition clips in your stream, you don't notice that lower resolutions are mixed in. All you notice is that the streaming never paused. The engineer's solution was very creative, but here's the rub. You can't see the creativity that underlies the streaming. It's undetectable. And many examples of creativity are covert like this. We typically don't know what's behind the facade of a building, but there's an ingenious network of pipes and wires and ducts and everything that keeps the building running. And it's totally invisible to us. But when you look at the Pompidou Center in Paris, the air ducts and pipes and wiring are all on the outside of the building. And that's what the arts give us is overt creativity. The arts showcase the creativity that lies hidden in our everyday lives. They expose the innards of the creative process. So whether creativity is overt or covert, the cognitive tools are the same. So let's take a closer look at how bending, breaking, and blending give birth to new ideas. We'll start with bending. Humans will bend just about anything we can get our hands on. For instance, these sculptures all bend the human form. And these are bends of horses. <clears throat> And you can bend our biology. So hearts fail, and scientists began to wonder if they could build an artificial one. And in 1982, this is what the artificial heart looked like. It was a mechanical pump, but it was big and energy hungry, and it got worn down. So in 2004, doctors came up with a novel solution. Instead of a pump, why not use a continuous flow? So blood gets oxygenated as it passes through and flows right back out. So when you get one of these installed, you no longer have a pulse. <clears throat> There's a heart inside your chest, but it doesn't use the same principles as the one that nature gave you. Instead, it's a bend of what is found in nature. Things can be bent in many ways. For instance, you can bend an object's size. For the Rio Olympics, the artist J.R. built an image of the high jumper Muhammad Idris several stories high. And just as bending can enlarge, it can also shrink. These are miniature figurines by the sculptor Alberto Giacometti. These examples of overt creativity expose the same creative approach that allowed Edwin Land to solve a big problem with automobiles. So in the 1920s, it was dangerous to drive at night because of the intense glare from the approaching headlights. So Land knew that he could eliminate the glare with polarizing crystals, but these were way too big to use for a windshield. So his aha moment was the same kind of thinking that was behind Giacometti's figurines. He realized the solution was to get these crystals down to a very small size. So he made glass sheets with thousands of tiny crystals embedded inside them. The driver got a better view of the road, but the creativity that produced it remained invisible. Size is just one of the features that could be bent. Architect Frank Gehry looked at the flat facades of buildings and wondered, could he bend the shape? The result is this Gary building in Lower Manhattan. A similar bend can allow cars to hold more fuel. One of the impediments to converting engines from gasoline to hydrogen is the bulkiness of the tank. Standard hydrogen tanks are these barrel-shaped things, and they take up a lot of cargo space. So the company Volute developed a tank that folds on itself in layers and can snake into the unused space of the car body. So they find ways to make the volume work by twisting it. And the human brain 
will even bend time. This clip from the movie 300 bends the speed. And time can also run backwards. And this sort of overt creativity is the same as the covert creativity found in the sciences. The ability to run films backwards got the physicist Ernst Stuckelberg to run a new kind of thought experiment, and he realized he could describe the behavior of elementary particles if he simply assumed that some of them were running backwards in time. So the particles that we call electrons are equivalent to protons racing the other way in time. And that kind of bending won him the Nobel Prize. Several scientists are pursuing the goal of cloning a Neanderthal by reversing the arrow of time. The idea is to start with a human genome, run evolution backwards, and undo all of ge the genetic changes that separate the two species. By bending time, these scientists hope to bring the Neanderthal back to life. When you start looking at creativity all around you, you'll notice lots of bending. Some are mild, as in caricature, and sometimes the bending is more dramatic. This is a self portrait of Francis Bacon. We sometimes might fall prey to the end of time illusion, in which we convince ourselves that everything that can be done has already been done. But the history of bending tells a different story. There is always more to squeeze out. For instance, this is a prehistoric knife. And this collection of knives is all from 19th century Polynesia. Cultures around the world have never stopped bending the knife. Likewise. Umbrellas have existed since ancient times, but the modern folding umbrella seems like we've finally arrived at the end of the line. But the United States Patent Office continues to receive so many patents for umbrellas that it has four full-time examiners to review them. So for instance, the Sens umbrella has an asymmetric shape that gives it better wind resistance. The new umbrella is worn like a backpack, making it hands-free. The umbrella folds upwards with the ribs on the outside. As a result of our perpetual manipulations, human culture never stops exploring variations on themes. Now let's turn to the second tool of innovation. New things are often built by taking something that already exists and taking it apart. We find examples of breaking all throughout the arts. For instance, Tchaikovsky quotes fragments of the French nat national anthem in his 1812 overture. First, let's I listen to Edith Piaf. Okay, now let's listen to how Tchaikovsky incorporates that fragment of the French national anthem into his orchestral work. In visual arts, cubism shattered the visual plane. And this is Barnett Newman's broken obelisk in which he snaps an obelisk in half. And the breaking that's so easy to observe in the arts, that same creative act happens in the scientific lab. It's just harder to see. This is Fred Sanger. He was trying to figure out a way to sequence long strands of DNA. So he devised a way to break up organic molecules into smaller strands that could be more easily analyzed and collated. And he won two Nobel Prizes for his breaking techniques for which are responsible for a lot of what we know about genomes now. So there are a lot of ways to break something. David Hockney created this photo collage using relatively big pieces. Meanwhile, in this pointillistic painting by Surratt, the pieces are much smaller, and there are a lot more of them. And in digital pixelation, the dots are so small that you're not supposed to see them. This kind of covert pixelation is the innovation that underlies our whole digital universe. Breaking also gives you the opportunity to leave pieces out. Bruno Catalano leaves out whole chunks of the human body in his sculpture, The Travelers. And the artist Corey Archangel created a video installation by hacking into the computer game Super Mario Clouds and removing everything but the clouds. He then projected the clouds onto large screens. These same principles of breaking lead to technological innovations. Late in the 19th century, farmers wanted to get rid of horses and replace them with the internal combustion engine. But the first tractors were so heavy that they compressed the soil and they ruined the crops. So it looked like mechanical plowing was not going to work. But then a man named Harry Ferguson came up with a breaking idea. Take away 
the undercarriage and the shell and plop a seat right on top of the engine. So by keeping part of the structure and throwing away, throwing away the rest, the modern tractor was born. And you can see the same principles at work in, in neuroscience. When you look at a brain, it's hard to tell where the pathways go and where they originate, but a new method called clarity washes away the fatty molecules and leaves the rest of the structure intact. So just as Archangel removed a part of the video game for his Mario Brothers installation, the same creative approach in the laboratory removes most of the brain and allows us to see it in a new way. Ungluing the pieces allows a structure to change shape. David Fisher's dynamic architecture breaks apart the solid frame of a building and allows the floors to move independently. <clears throat> so taking this idea of breaking, engineers designed a prosthetic hand and, and they realized they didn't have to be limited by biology. Our wrists are constrained by our tendons, but the engineers could break that constraint. So why not design a wrist that can just keep on turning? <laughs> so whether you're an artist or a scientist, breaking opens a world of creative options to take things apart and put them back together in new ways. Now we'll move on to the last of the creative tools, blending, which merges sources. For instance, all over the world, cultures have blended humans and animals to create mythological creatures. In ancient Egypt, if you blend a man with a lion, you get a sphinx. In Africa, if you blend a woman with a fish, you get a mamiwata. And this is a lion goat from ancient Italy. What happens in myth also happens in science. Spider silk is stronger than steel, but it's very difficult to harvest it. If you try to raise a lot of spiders together, they eat each other. So <laughs> a geneticist came up with an idea that was akin to the mythological creatures. And he spliced the DNA for making spider silk into a goat. And the result was Freckles the spider goat, who secretes spider silk in her milk. She's a real life chimera. Blending is pervasive in the arts. For instance, in hip hop music, fragments from previous music are repurposed or blended together to create a new song. Here's a drum solo called the Amen Break from a 1969 song by the band The Winstons. That solo has been blended into a track by Mantronics. And Salt and Peppa. And almost 2,000 other songs, all of which have blended the DNA of the old into the new. The brain often makes exotic combinations from things that it's seen before. For example, in this video installation, a woman's torso is blended with a lifeless pile of gravel. And a similar blend forms a solution to the problem of the world's crumbling buildings and roads. So half the world's structures are made of concrete, but concrete gets worn down by the weather and it's hard to repair. So scientists blended concrete with a bacterium that secretes calcite, which is one of concrete's main ingredients. As long as the concrete is intact, then the bacteria lie dormant. But if the concrete cracks, the bacteria wake up, they spawn and spread, and they excrete calcite that seals the damage. So as a result of the blending of non-living and living, the concrete heals itself. Human imagination places no limits on what can be blended with what. For instance, you can blend the past with the present. They're, uh, they're flocking this way. And you can blend the present and the future. Oh, 
does it mean, exact change? <laughs> Sometimes the elements of a blend touch, but they don't merge. For instance, I am Pei blended an Egyptian pyramid into the courtyard of the Louvre Palace, and Frida Kahlo painted her head on the body of a deer. Other times, the sources are more merged. The Blur building has walls that are made of water, and here, human portraits are projected onto trees. And here, the sources are even more thoroughly mixed. It's not easy to tell that Jasper John's painting consists of the numbers 0 through 9 superimposed on each other. We're surrounded by these sorts of blends, often in ways that we can't see. So 5,000 years ago, the very first alloys invented, uh, one of the first alloys was bronze. And you can't tell just by looking at this shiny, flexible material that it's actually a blend of two materials, copper and tin. When you import an image into a graphics program, oh, are we missing a slide here? No, that's it. No, oh, all right. When, when you import an image into a graphics program, the software doesn't care if it's a photo of airplanes or zebras. As far as it's concerned, rotate image is just an algorithm that works on the zeros and ones. In the same way, our neural networks process mental input using very basic subroutines. Whether we're thinking about a patent or a musical riff or a new recipe or what to say next, we transform the raw materials of experience by bending, breaking, and blending them. We're all running this software under the hood. Creativity doesn't emerge out of thin air. We depend on culture to provide a storehouse of raw materials, which we then transform. And we don't just replace the things that don't work. We update the things that we love. That's why fashions constantly change and haircuts evolve through the decades and car makers come up with new models every year. Edward Manet broke good to create his 1863 painting Le Déjeuner sur l'Elbe. Using this 15th century engraving as a starting point, Manet transformed the three mythological feature, fig, figures in the lower right-hand corner into two bourgeois gentlemen and a prostitute lounging in a Parisian park. His painting helped to launch modern art. Later, Picasso innovated on what Manet had done. He showed his love for Manet by remodeling it. And several generations after that, Robert Colescott remodeled Picasso's iconic Les Demoiselles d'Avignon into his Les Demoiselles d'Alabama. So creativity is propelled when we treat the past as treasured, but not untouchable. So now let's move on to the next lesson. In order to get there, uh, we'd like you to do something here. So for just a moment, close your eyes and imagine standing on a beach at sunset. So go ahead and imagine that. OK, so you can open your eyes. My question is, how many of you pictured coconut husks on the sand? <laughs> how many of you pictured a sliver of moon in the sky? How about swimmers in the water? How about a crescent moon in the sky? OK. So this is pretty impoverished. And the question is, why? Why was everyone's view so impoverished about this? So here's the answer. It has to do with the fact that every concept in the brain is connected with other concepts in this very, very rich network. So when I asked you about a beach, you could have pulled up any one of these concepts. But strangely, you didn't. Instead, when I ask about the beach, you went straight to the issue of sand and water. And the question is, why? And this has to do with the concept of the path of least resistance. So your brain has evolved to be ruthlessly efficient. So if you're hungry, you go and you find food. You don't dance or paint or something like that. But there's a way to dig back in there to get a richer harvest from what's already in there. Proliferate options. Don't imagine there's a single answer. Anytime you generate a solution, challenge yourself to come up with another and another. Generating a spectrum, spectrum of options is a cornerstone of the creative process. Here's Velasquez's famous painting, Las Meninas. And here are four of 57 variations Picasso painted of Las Meninas. And just as in the arts, generating options is crucial in the sciences. In the post-Reconstruction South, decades of cotton farming had ruined the soil. George Washington Carver identified the peanut as an ideal rotation crop, but he knew that the southern farmers wouldn't grow peanuts without a way to sell them. So he invented over 100 uses for the peanut, including peanut oil, milk, face cream, ice cream, punch, and glue. 
So he was given 10 minutes to testify before the House Ways and Means Committee about the value of peanut farming, but he so impressed the committee with his creative options that he ended up testifying for a full hour. So what we, in what we've just seen, Picasso and Carver put their proliferation on display. Often, though, the generation of options occurs behind the scenes. For instance, industrial designer Max Kulik sketched dozens of versions of a single person vehicle with the driver standing or seated, one, two, or three wheels, a rigid or fold up frame on his way to developing his concept vehicle, the City Smoother. And Thomas Edison set idea quotas for his employees. So whenever they were facing a new challenge, he would say, don't come back to me with one idea for how to solve this, but come back to me with seven different ideas for how to solve this. And this inspired productivity to a different level. So industrious minds constantly push themselves to generate an ongoing stream of alternatives. As we land on creative solutions, we continually need to ask ourselves, what else? And there's another twist to proliferation. As we've seen, all creativity is tethered to its history. The question is how far to move away from it. On the one hand, if you stay too close to the familiar, you may be left behind. Take the BlackBerry smartphone, the first mobile phone to incorporate a QWERTY keyboard. Here's the BlackBerry's market share. What happened? Well, the BlackBerry started off as a winning idea but the company didn't anticipate how fast touchscreen technology would catch on. BlackBerry held on to the right answer for too long. So sometimes holding on to earlier successes is not enough. A big leap is what seizes the public imagination. But there's also a risk in going too far. It may be that no one follows you there. So as an example, between the end of the Civil War and the start of World War II, there were several hundred attempts to create a universal language. Dignitaries like Eleanor Roosevelt supported these efforts, knowing that a shared language would help with issues of world peace. And nothing came closer to achieving the vision of a universal language than Esperanto. Just after World War II, a half a million people petitioned the United Nations to adopt it as the official world language. Here's a clip from a William Shatner movie filmed entirely in Esperanto. <laughs> but ultimately, Esperanto failed to catch on. Although our world would be enriched by a universal language, asking populations to learn an entirely new language was too big a move. It can be challenging to find the sweet spot between familiarity and novelty. Sticking closely to what works can quickly wear out its welcome, but leaving the comfortable too far behind can fail to find followers. The solution, go different distances from community standards. For instance, designer Sarah Burton created the royal wedding dress worn by Kate Middleton. And she also created other wedding dresses less likely to be worn at imperial nuptials. And the same person who patented this blouse in this refrigerator also came up with the theory of relativity. In the early 1930s, American industrial designer Norman Belgetis devised a host of practical commercial products, including radios, cocktail shakers, desks, and kitchen appliances. But Belgetis didn't stop there. He also imagined futuristic looking buses with fuel tanks in the tail fins and a flying car called the rotable airplane. Other far out projects included the aerial restaurant in which diners would be perched on a rotating mechanism more than 20 stories tall. Belgetti's also conceived of a house with movable walls that could rise up into the ceiling like garage doors. And innovative companies follow a similar strategy. Mercedes Benz is constantly updating its sedan but its engineers have also con conceived of the biome concept car, which is a biodegradable car that would be grown entirely from seeds. The car's zero emissions fuel wouldn't be stored in a tank, but it would flow through the car's frame and wheels. Its electronics would be powered by its solar sunroof. For now, the biome car only exists on a computer. Mercedes has no immediate plans to develop it, but the goal of a concept car is not to be the next car, Instead, it's to focus on a far-reaching possibility. It allows a company to examine what lies on the distant horizon 
whether or not society ever goes in that direction. Similarly, Microsoft is constantly improving its computer servers, but the massive circuitry generates lots of heat. So Microsoft is also experimenting with submersible tanks that would house computer servers in the depths of the ocean. The first prototype made it back safely to shore covered with barnacles. In a similar vein, the company Fisher Price continually upgrades its cradles and strollers and toys, but it also has an eye on what's coming further down the line. Its future of parenting line examines how technological advances might impact the child rearing of tomorrow. The person who only tinkers with prior art may be weak on breakthroughs, while the one who dives full time into moonshots may never develop the competencies to realize a vision. Instead of remaining at a fixed distance, an optimal strategy is to generate a range of ideas, some of which stay closer to home, while others fly farther. And finally, there's no such thing as a can't miss creative idea. You can't, you can't attempt something new and rest assured about the results. For every good idea, a lot of others don't survive. It takes a high risk tolerance to be creative. For instance, here's how James Dyson described his risky process of trying to invent the bagless vacuum cleaner. By the time I made my 15th prototype, my third child was born. By 2,627, my wife and I were really counting our pennies. By 3,727, my wife was giving art lessons for some extra cash. These were tough times, but each failure brought me closer to solving the problem. It eventually took Dyson 15 years and, five, and over 5,000 prototypes to launch his product. Across human history, new ideas take root in environments where failure is tolerated. It's important to be fearless in the face of error. So let's recap. Creativity is part of the software of every human brain. Innovation doesn't come out of the thin air. Ideas evolve. All new ideas have a history. The creative process transcends disciplines. We bend, break, and blend our storehouse of experiences, remodeling what we know. Creativity is overt in the arts, which is why we need to include them in the way that we educate our children. We propel our creativity when we break good, go different distances from community standards, proliferate options, and tolerate risk. We're a species with a runaway imagination. As far as we can tell, no other species puts as much effort into exploring imaginary territories. Our innate cognitive software has produced a society with increasingly faster innovation, one that feeds upon its latest ideas. So currently, we have 8 billion brains running the cognitive software of creativity and there are more raw materials than ever to bend, break, and blend. All of us are chiseling in the cliffside of history to build our tomorrows. By understanding our ability to innovate, our most profound, mysterious, and deeply human capacity, we can all go out to remake our world. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll do any Q&A. Yes. The, can I just repeat the question? The question is, is creativity being fostered in our schools? So one of our motivations for writing the book together is to address that problem, because by far it isn't. And you know, in the effort, a lot of it well-intentioned to make sure that all kids, especially in the public schools, get a comparable education, Testing now so commands the school day that uh, basically there's no t time left over for the kind of work that we're describing in our talk, where there's multiple options and there's a chance for error and the kids are free to develop their own ideas independently. And so we, of course, feel very, very strongly that, I mean, we are here in this world with everything around us primarily because of our creativity. And if we don't cultivate that in our students, we're doing them an incredible disservice. So we wrote this book, The Runaway Species, which won't be out till October, but we have a whole chunk of this book devoted towards education and how to build a creative classroom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, 
I would also say that it should be a, like a parenting manual. I mean, many p parents don't cultivate this atmosphere at all. I mean, you, you, I mean, how would you suggest parents cultivate this? Well, we talk about that a little bit in the book. You know, there's so many ready-mades around us right now, but if you give every opportunity you can, not just for your kids, but for yourself, uh, to do things like make your own greeting cards or uh, experiment with recipes. Um, do anything that you can do yourself. The signs that get posted at school that say, don't run in the hallways. Why not have the kids make them? Uh, instead of just grabbing stuff off the shelf, the more you build the creative ritual and give kids the ideas that they're going to be the makers of their own world, then the more they're going to grow up in power to do that. Yeah, and I'll just add that you know one of the important things in education and with our was we're raising our children is teaching them all the skills that they need and then making sure that they use those to launch off in their own directions. Mm -hmm. Often what happens with schooling is we just teach them the skills that they need and then we assume that's enough instead of forcing them to proliferate options from there. What's that? Which means allowing them to fail. Yeah, yeah absolutely. exactly. That's a big part of it. Yeah, giving kids sandboxing opportunities where they get to play in the sandbox and try things and fail a whole bunch of times, and that's okay. They're not getting judged uh, or graded for that. Yeah. Yes, there's a question in the back. Oh, oh sorry. We, <laughs> I'll just follow the microphone here. Yeah. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about how this creative union came about? Yeah. <laughs> Tony and I have known each other for many years, and... Um, I worked at Baylor College of Medicine in the Texas Medical Center, and Tony works at Rice University uh, in the music department, and they're right across the street from one another. So we've been friends, and one day we were having a coffee, and we started talking about creativity, and it turns out we had both been giving talks on creativity from our two different angles. And the more we talked about it, we realized there was a whole world there to be, to be mined and explored. So that's how that came about. Could you, uh, is there another dimension that comes into play when you apply creativity to social issues, transforming the social fabric? Yeah, I think in general the story is that we all get so used to whatever the social fabric is around us that it's sort of rare that we think about uh, ways of redoing it. And, you know, there were lots of failed times in history with the French Revolution or the Communist Revolution or whatever, where people tried things and it failed. But, but what I really admire is the idea of just saying, well, what if we rebooted this? What if we had a different way of it? You know, the French said, let's make a week five days instead of seven <laughs> days. And, you know, just, it, lots of things that were just extremely creative. And I think that kind of act is very important. Um, because otherwise, we become like fish trying to describe water. It becomes, our whole social fabric becomes something that never even gets questioned. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. This was really, really fascinating. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about now, having heard you talk about the process of creativity and innovation, is um, you know, our culture will grab onto an idea and then focus on it with intensity, and it will become the new thing. Um, and one thing that we never really seem to talk about is the value of rest and reflection. So I'm wondering if you at all um, looked at in the process of innovation, how much reflection comes into play? I think that's a very cool way of framing it. I think part of what we were trying to do in the book is to show this incredible digestion in a sense that society does where it leaps on things and those pass quickly and there's other stuff it's thinking about for a very long time and it goes in these tidal waves of different force and strength and it's risky, it's totally unpredictable, there's no way we know exactly where we're going tomorrow because there's just so many brains at work transforming our worlds around us. Um, so I, it's not a quite complete answer to your question, but absolutely society is thinking at many different time scales about what it really wants and it needs and what works. Yeah, yeah, and to do the bending and breaking and blending requires some amount of reflection so that you can take all these inputs you've had and, and put them together in some way. And I think people have totally different ways of finding that reflective time. Some people do it by exercising, some people do it by taking a hot shower and whatever. But, but that part is a really important part of the process, giving time for the stuff to come together in weird ways. Mm -hmm. Question in the back. Yeah. 
Actually, over here, over there. There, there are a couple. Oh, okay. there. Hi, thank you all. Um, I have a question with bending, breaking, and blending, but more specifically the blending. Where does attribution come into play in the idea of maybe co-opting or taking other ideas? How do you um, negotiate that? So that's, I would say, a very important social issue, the idea of appropriation, like cultural appropriation. But I think our basic attitude is that for creative minds, nothing can be out off limits. I mean, that's why culture exists for human beings, because we actually depend on a storehouse of raw materials to draw on. We have a, a story in the book about a woman whose memory was totally damaged by encephalitis. And she was a very talented artist. She painted covers for The New Yorker. And without a storehouse of raw materials, she had nothing to draw. And she was just uh, immobilized as a painter. And, and it's a good example of how we really need each other and everything we've created in our joint history. And the more our worlds come together and the more we share this stuff, I, I think we would both say the more we actually uh, need to be able to, to access it um, in, in any, any way that's appropriate. Yeah, and what's funny is that we're stuck with this illusion that, that creativity is this bolt out of the blue and that people think of something and discover, but it actually never happens that way. Every creative idea comes from all the other ideas and then it's some, uh, it's some new bending, breaking, or blending of that. So anyway, this is where it becomes an interesting question because of this, because of this impression that we all like to hold on to that something can be come up with that's, it can, it can be generated that's totally new without a history, but everything has that. Over there and question over there. Um, I've <coughs> I have two questions. I don't know if you choose to answer them that way, but I'm referring to uh, Walter Isaacson's book on uh, creativity and technology. And those who were the most successful were the technologists and internet and so on who agreed to work together versus those who stayed apart and said, I, I want to keep this idea to myself. And the ones who worked together were able to create something new and really different. And the second question is, in our world of high tech and information and news every second, is that helpful to creativity or is that reducing our ability to be as creative because we are spending so much time on learning what's going on that we don't have time to, like the uh, other woman said, reflect and rest and think about things? So two great questions. Um, for the first one, I think we would say that we would take an all of the above approach to the answer. Um, so for instance, right now the off open office plan is really uh, very much in public's eye and Facebook and Apple are all striving for these open office plans. But there's a new book out about the invention of the iPhone that talks about how secretive the process was and there was very few people who knew, knew about it. And they had to sign non-disclosure agreements about signing non-disclosure agreements and uh, Sony uh, and Nintendo, they did a lot of their great innovations uh, 20 years ago in very siloed places. Uh, now extraordinary things happen from teams working together. I think human creativity is so complicated that there are all sorts of ways that we arrive at, at creating things. And there'll be examples spread out all over the place. Yeah. And for the second one, I think it depends on the news. <laughs> yeah, for the second one, let me just say one thing, which is the second last slide we showed was this exponential increase in where humankind is going. And the technologies that we have are all building on one another. So every time anything new gets invented, other stuff gets piled on and people think, wow, I could take that and put that together with that and blend it and break it. And so things are <clears throat> provably only getting faster. So, so the high tech and the, the pace of the data coming at us seems to, be, seems to be working, actually. Because we all remember growing up where if you wanted to learn something, you, your mother had to drive you over to the library, and then you pull out the Encyclopedia Britannica and look stuff up slowly. The, the pace at which you can obtain stuff now and put things together is really remarkable. So I'm sort of a cyber optimist on this point. <laughs> David, while they're getting the microphone to you, um, Describe the circumstances in which you are most creative, and both and Anthony. How did writing the book change that? Mm. I think writing the book formalized it a bit, where we really realized the degree to which, first of all, this issue of taking an input is super useful, and being able to think about 
breaking, bending, and blending, and you know, okay, well, what if I took this and I put this together and I did that sort of thing? That's just been a really, um, it's probably, I mean, it's what we had been doing anyway, but it sort of formalized the process for us where we thought about that a lot more. And um, yeah. I think a lot of times we sort of felt like we were living the book as we were making it. Yeah, so it, right, right now we're in the risk part. Uh, you know, we've been told the bo book's on the boat from China, and you know, it's a, an interesting feeling imagining it slowly making its way to shore and not, wondering how the world will receive it. And you know, we tried to proliferate options and we'd, we'd constantly be coming in with different ways of organizing stuff, and you know, that part was incredibly fun. Uh, let the microphone. Uh. Hi. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the question you asked over here about social issues and using this bending, breaking, and. <laughs> Gesture with your other hand. <laughs> All right, how about my foot? There's a change. <laughs> but anyhow, take the criminal justice system. Most folks say it's, if not broken, terribly broken, and certainly not effective. And what would it take, or do you have any examples, and that's what I really want to know, do you have any examples of where people have been able to demonstrate creativity in, in parts of, or big, sure. small, whatever? Sure. And is it in the book? You should take it. Yeah. That. So, I so have to buy the book. What, one, of the thi <laughs> one of the things, I, I'm a neuroscientist, but I also direct uh, a, a 501c3 called the Center for Science and Law. And it's exactly on this sort of topic. And it turns out that people, do do very creative things to improve the justice system, but it's only when they run out of money and they have to. Hmm. Um, but in any case, this happens in, in this has happened in several counties now, where they have too many prisoners and they want to build a bigger uh, prison and they just can't afford it. And so what they realize is there's a way that they can uh, apply creativity and apply breaking in a sense to improve things. So they spin off specialized court systems. So you have a specialized drug court where you have juries and judges with expertise in drug rehabilitation so that, uh, so that instead of incarcerating people only, you can actually put them on rehabilitative programs. A separate mental health court where juries and judges have expertise in mental health so that you can, when someone says they have schizophrenia, you don't think, oh, well, that's BS. Instead, you understand what that's about and you can figure out ways to, to rehabilitate. A separate prostitution court because Prostitution is actually a different kind of crime than, than other sorts of crimes. Um, and so you have all these different court systems that are specialized. That's a very creative way to break up the process. So people are doing things like this all over the place. And you know, in science, um, there's a lot of intersection with the legal system, just as an example, with drug rehabilitation possibilities and mechanisms. We understand a lot about the circuitry and pharmacology of drug addiction, and so instead of trying to attack drug supply, which is what we've been doing for decades, we can address drug demand, which is the brain of the addict. Hmm. We had a question. Yeah. Um, Have you ever thought about like partnering up with like heart high schools or grammar schools to like share this? Yes. Yeah, in fact our first presentations together about this were to teachers. And we're, you know, I, that's one of we, what we hope with the fates of, of our project together, um, is if we could have some, any kind of impact in, on the school system and contribute to there being more creativity in all subjects, and using the arts to help expose the creativity and then practicing in, all, in every subject that you take, you know, we would feel incredibly uh, sa satisfied and rewarded. Um, it, it seems like, uh, again, about the social re-engineering, it seems like in a lot of areas where, um, although we, I, I agree with everything you said about creativity, that, that there's a lot of anchoring to the status quo. You know, almost every building and some of the things that you showed in the video were, were reviled before they became beloved. And things, you know, in the social area, things like, charter schools, you know, there's a whole con constituency that says, you know, that, that kind of prevents experimentation. So what's going on there? So again, I think we just have to pay homage to human complexity. 
and acknowledge the fact that you can never really predict how fast we're going to open ourselves to change. In some areas, we respond to it almost instantaneously, and we're just incredibly eager for it. And in others, we're just much more slow and cautious and stubborn about things. And humans kind of stagger along, sometimes making leaps, sometimes making small steps. It's one of the things that makes creativity so risky and so unpredictable. And, and I don't think it would be able, anybody would ever to be able to reduce it to a formula and say, okay, it's always gonna follow this path. It's actually the fact that we, together and individually, are so complicated that it's always gonna have this meandering quality to it. Yeah, and, and there's this interesting feedback with technology, which itself is a creative act, but you know, as new technologies come along, that really changes the face of creativity. So with the internet, um, you know, that's, that's just opened up the world where kids are able to obtain knowledge from lots of different sources. So I think we'll be seeing, a, you know, an a exponential increase that keeps going even faster. Our political system certainly seems to be broken. Any suggestions you would give to either Congress or the administration on how they might be able to come up with a better idea? Collaborate. <laughs> I mean, whether it's marriage or politics, no one's ever right about everything. And it's really healthy to have smart, caring people with different points of view working together to arrive at a solution. I don't think that's necessarily something we address in our book, but it seems to us, I would say, a common sense solution to a lot of the problems that we're going through. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, and hand in hand with that is just this issue about proliferating options and experimenting. So mm. just as an example, in California, one of the things where I'm from, one of the things that's being considered is a universal basic income. So what if every family um, got $1,000 a month just for existing? Hmm. And, um, and it's a really interesting idea, but no one knows whether it'll work or not work. So what uh, some, some wealthy philanthropists are doing is starting an experiment in Oakland where they're doing this with, I forget if it's 100 or 1,000 families, hmm. where they're giving everyone 1,000 bucks a month, and they've got academics there, and they're watching, and they're seeing how it works. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But uh, doing the experimentation in service of new political moves is really a, a lovely idea. This works. Okay, there we go. Um, I wonder if you could comment on something that I uh, read recently, which was, uh, I think, an article published uh, in, by a neuroscientist. had to do with two distinct functions in the brain, cognitive functions, and one being exploration and the other being exploitation. <laughs> You're both smiling. And, and I think this is probably in the breaking, um, the 3B model. But to the extent that there was this opportunity, the woman was asking about reflection. And it seems as though um, for the brain, for the brain to offer more innovative thinking, more spaciousness, reflection, or a, a sense of ease is vital for that. And I think about the lack of boredom or daydreaming that we do now, where people reach for their phones every time they have an instant of being bored. So I'm curious about that where we don't daydream anymore and there is, in a sense, perhaps a loss of an opportunity to be, for, the, for our brains to be more explorative and more ultimately creative. Um, here's what I would say. So we, we spent a lot of time in the, in the book talking about exploration, exploitation trade-off, which actually is true across the animal kingdom, which is that you have to take all the things you've learned and you know and exploit that and you have to spend some amount of your time exploring. I think in general, I mean, again, I'm a cyber optimist, but I think it's very difficult to know what the effect of the digital world is on the next generation. I have a suspicion that the next generation is going to be a lot smarter than we are. And um, the reason it's so difficult to do the experiments is because to do any experiment, you need a control group. And we don't have, for 18-year-olds, you know, a control group that didn't grow up digital where everything else is the same too. Like we can compare them to mm. Amish people, but there's a lot of other differences. Or we compare them to terribly impoverished kids, but there's a lot of other differences. And you can't compare to a previous generation because there's a thousand other differences. So it's just really hard to know exactly what's gonna happen. But I feel like kids, even when they're just surfing around or whatever, they're, they're coming in contact with really new ideas, ideas that um, in our day would have taken us a long time to stumble on. By, by going down to the library. So I happen to be pretty enthusiastic about this. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Yes. 
Hi. Uh, so kind of building off of the previous political and uh, behavioral change questions, uh, before the three Bs can happen, there has to be some acceptance of what might happen. And so how do you respond to the fear question? Because I think there's a lot of fear in our country right now, and there's a lot of insecurity and lack of empowerment. And so how do you spur this change if you have people that are so scared and so uh, afraid to let go, even though we acknowledge that things are very broken? I'd say there's a couple of things. First of all, own the fact that we all have this same software. It's not a luxury, it's not a gift, it doesn't only belong to a few people, every single person has this. The second is that everything we love and cherish about life was created because of that. And so if we're going to keep progressing and developing and growing as a species, we should honor and respect and uh, you know, love this feature of ourselves that brings out the best in us in, in a sense. And I, hopefully one of our purposes in the book is just to inspire everybody to think about how great it is that we all have this capability and the things we all can do with it in our own lives, hopefully contributing to making the world a better place. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to come off too much as an optimist, but I feel like, <laughs> I feel like as far as the current political situation or whatever, it doesn't matter. Everyone keeps going every day mm. and, and living our own lives and we keep being really creative and generating new things. And so there's a sense in which what's happening in this country now has, I think, no influence on what brains are actually doing in terms of what we see every day and how we put things together and generate it. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much Thank for your attention. Thank you so much.